We never saw the flashing battle line, that arch of bright steel that stretches 300 miles between France and Germany. We did not hear the cannon or long lines of men cheering as they swept into action, or the dying horses scream. We saw none of the pageantry of war, but we did get a glimpse behind the scenes of its most real, its most lasting part. We saw the long ambulance trains, those rivers of pain running back from the lines. We saw strong men sobbing with agony like children. We saw their women struggling alone against anxiety and poverty, pale women with that look in their eyes which comes of sleepless nights and unshed tears. We heard little children crying for the father's love they will never know again. All these things are the necessary routine of war. We have seen, and we can never forget. Over 24,000 American women participated overseas during the four years of World War I. Half of these women were nurses, serving with the United States Army, Navy, and the American Red Cross. Others were clerks, cooks, telephone operators, canteen workers, journalists, photographers, and doctors. Most of them came into the conflict after America entered the war in April 1917. However, in the months between August 1914 and December 1915, 255 American nurses were assigned by the Red Cross to care for wounded and sick soldiers in Europe. These dedicated women volunteered, not knowing whether their country would become involved in the hostilities. This is the story of one of these nurses, told through her many letters and the hundreds of photographs she took with a Kodak camera during her four years as a nurse in hospitals in France. Marion McCune Rice was born in 1882 in Brattleboro, a small town on the Connecticut River in southern Vermont. Her father, Charles Bingham Rice, died of injuries he had received years earlier as a soldier in the Civil War, leaving his wife, Fanny Crosby Rice, with two children, Marion, age three, and Howard, seven. Marion attended Brattleboro Public Schools. She graduated from Brattleboro High School in 1900 and entered Mount Holyoke College in South Hadley, Massachusetts, transferring to nearby Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts at the start of her sophomore year. From their origins, both colleges won distinction for the education of women and both encouraged students to undertake a life of service to others. Marion graduated from Smith with a Bachelor of Arts degree. Marion left college without a clear career choice, but at age 24, she decided to enter nursing, a typical livelihood for single educated women at the beginning of the 20th century. Women had the opportunity for education only a short time. They had also been able to go out into the paid economy and work for a relatively short time in areas of women's traditional er uh, service, such as teaching, nursing, and the new field of social work. And I think they also, for the first time, were able to be independent in that paid economy of family to a large extent. So it's not surprising that those same women, when they saw the opportunity to be of service in France during a world war, sought that opportunity as a place where they could indeed contribute again in that area of service to other people. She earned her certification at the Pennsylvania Hospital School of Nursing in Philadelphia. She served as head nurse at two hospitals in that city. In the summer of 1914, Marion made her fourth visit to Europe as a tourist. The unexpected turn of events she encountered on this trip proved momentous for herself and for the world. From the Brattleboro Reformer, September 16, 1914, Miss Marion Rice reached the home of her brother in this town last evening after a European trip that was considerably altered, very much enlivened, and to some extent prolonged by the outbreak of war. After she returned to the U.S., Marion contacted the Washington, D.C. office of the American Red Cross and volunteered for a nursing assignment overseas. 
The Red Cross had already been preparing itself for a wartime emergency, thanks to the vision and leadership of the chairman of the National Committee of Nursing Service, Miss Jane Delano. Perhaps one of the great things coming out of that early period was the ability of Jane Delano as a director of nursing to recognize as early as 1912 and 1913 that problems were afoot. Everyone was aware that there seemed to be trouble brewing overseas. She began to plan for this great emergency. She just knew in her heart, having been through the Spanish-American War and having been around since the early days of the Red Cross, that uh, she needed to have a program. You have to remember that the medical situation in Europe at the beginning of World War I was incredibly non-existent. I don't know how anybody can prepare to have a war without preparing to take care of the wounded, but they managed. And I think one reason that nurses in particular wanted to go was that they could see that the need was just desperate. You can't believe a situation in which an army transport will take boxcars of wounded men up into a little country station, unload them onto the platform, and leave. Just plain leave. Uh, the cannon would be placed about every six yards, and every yard of the front would receive four and three quarter tons of shells. So you can imagine the immensity of loss here of hundreds of thousands of lives. So anything that came within the ranges of the guns was just devastated in a way the world had never seen before. In September 1914, the American Red Cross had sent nurses, surgeons, and tons of medical supplies in a mercy ship to help injured soldiers on both sides of the war in Europe. Four months later, a smaller unit of nine nurses was being organized. While Marion Rice, 32, was undergoing the required typhoid and smallpox vaccinations in Vermont, other nurses were preparing themselves also. Mary M. Fletcher of Charlottesville, Virginia, Mary K. Nelson of Fall River, Massachusetts, and Josephine Clay from Philadelphia joined Marion, ready to sail for duty in Europe. They would fill the request for nurses from an American doctor already on duty at a hospital in France. Dr. Ralph Fitch, an exceptionally skilled orthopedic surgeon from Rochester General Hospital in New York, had volunteered his services to the French as early as December 1914. Dr. Fitch, his wife Ruth, his teenage stepdaughter Agnes Bartlett, and this group of nurses would remain together as a medical team for four years. The nurses sailed from New York aboard the Rochambeau on February 23, 1915. March 4, 1915, Yves Toe, France. Dear Amy, our last day on shipboard was rather exciting. They removed all the electric bulbs from our staterooms and got every lifeboat and raft ready to swing off at a moment's notice. We could see the searchlights from the English coast sweeping the water, and we passed a lot of mine draggers. It wasn't a terribly cheerful feeling that at any minute we might go up in smoke, particularly as we'd been told we carried much ammunition, arms, motor trucks, and so forth. We thought we'd be a prey worth hunting for. Won't you please save my letters for me? for I am not keeping a diary and I should like to have them. Lots of love, Marion. During the war, the Northern Front, in particularly Belgium and Northern France, was one of the most dangerous sections. Uh, the Valley of the Somme in France, and particularly around uh, the city or small medieval textile town of Ypres, which was dangerous. Uh, more casualties were sustained in that area perhaps than any other during the war. Marion and her colleagues joined Dr. Fitch and a staff of British doctors and nurses at the Hôpital de l'Alliance in Yvetot, about 80 miles west of Paris and 140 miles south of the battle raging in Belgium. The nurses immediately set to work caring for patients in the 265-bed hospital. At first they had only a few hundred typhoid cases here. Not long ago, they received 150 wounded men from hospitals nearer the front. There were a few Belgians, five or six Turks, the rest French. They are a cheerful looking lot. You should hear them whistle and sing while they peel potatoes. 
If anyone would give you any jigsaw puzzles, I'd be glad to have them. The men love the jigsaws above everything. We put boards between two beds for tables. I am supposed to be the supervisor. The official title is Knight Sister, and duties include matron's maid, general overseer, errand girl, office boy, coal heaver and fire stoker, lamp filler, night cook and dishwasher, light extinguisher, gas saver, general buffer, besides other duties too numerous to mention. So one month after she arrived in April, the second battle of Ypres broke out, uh, during which time um, fantastic casualties were occurring. Uh, the, one of the first gas attacks occurred there, chlorine gas fired by the Germans, decimating as many as 60 percent of the Canadians who had fought at Ypres. Uh, the casualties were in the hundreds of thousands. The battle lasted about a month, and Marion's hospital at Ito, uh, about 140 miles away from Ypres, would have received most likely some of those casualties, and they would come in in droves, uh, sometimes by wagon ambulances, other times by automotive ambulances, by trains, and of course when these battles were in full flow, uh, the wounded uh, the, would be pouring into them, and uh, the nurses would be working literally round the clock, the whole medical staff. Monday night I came in to find that more wounded were to arrive, which they did. You should have seen the excitement. Some were fresh from the trenches, some had been in hospitals nearer the front a day or two, some were convalescents. Wounded men who were received directly from the front arrived with their blood-clotted uniforms still on them, caked with mud and black with powder. Some had spent the winter of 1914-1915 in the trenches, where shelling left their nerves threadbare. Continual cigarette smoking resulted in shortened breath. These men were in poor physical condition for long surgeries under general anesthesia, so often their operations were delayed. One of our patients, a man of 30, has lost both arms. Yesterday, his wife, who had not seen him for months, came into the ward. His face was heartbreaking to look at. He tried so hard to keep the tears back, but they would come, and she had to wipe them away. Mary M. Fletcher. The man by whose bed I am standing is to be decorated for bravery as soon as he is able. He swam a river one night, lay for nine hours without moving among the dead in a battlefield. The next night crawled up to the enemy's lines and gained valuable information, then swam back again. He is one of the bravest men about standing pain that I have ever seen. In May 1915, a German torpedo sank the unarmed British passenger ship Lusitania in the Atlantic with the loss of 1,198 lives, 128 of them American but it would be two more years before the United States would come into the war. In several letters home, Marion expressed impatience with her own country's continued neutrality. You will not find many Americans over here who have much pride in the way our country is acting. Have you ever heard bombs and seen the result? Have you ever seen men choking and strangling the poison gas? Have you seen wounds too horrible almost to be looked at? Have you ever talked to people whose lives are in the hands of the Germans, whose wives and children have dropped out of the world for them? Have you ever seen flocks of tiny Serbian refugee babies and long processions of Belgian children? Whether they are orphans or not, nobody knows. It is all right to say how much America has done for the war. We have given money and lots of it, but it is a long way off to you over there, and you haven't the faintest idea what it means. After five months, the French authorities asked Dr. Fitch and the American nurses to move from the British hospital at Yvetot to saint valery en caux a French fishing village on the coast of the English Channel between Le Havre and Dieppe. At this hospital, they would be able to receive injured soldiers directly from the trenches. I wish you could have seen our departure from Yvetot. Most of the patients who could hobble marched down to our house to see us off. They brought us huge bouquets of flowers and made little speeches. It was really very touching. The nurses worked many days, converting the small resort hotel into a 161-bed hospital. They did every chore, from scrubbing walls to hooking up sterilization equipment. 
We are awfully busy. The real thing. Work that we never had in Eve Toe. The last lot came in at midnight. One hundred, of which I got forty-four on my floor. Such wounds as I have never seen before, and I thought I'd seen horrible ones. Shattered hips, knees, and shoulders, all calling for expert nursing care. Nurse Mary K. Nelson. Je fus blessé dans le département de la Somme, à la jambe droite. I was wounded in the department of the Somme. I had caught the explosion of a grenade in my right leg, and the bones had been broken. I was evacuated to Amiens by ambulance. The head doctor told me that they had to cut off my leg. It was completely rotted, and I was in great pain. But after the amputation of the leg, I never suffered. But it is sad to have lost a leg so young. I was evacuated to the hospital in saint valery en caux where I'm very well taken care of by the doctors and nurses of the Red Cross. I'm glad to be in this hospital. All the doctors and nurses are good to the wounded and give them good care. Charles Bizarre, 64th French Infantry Regiment. We love the French. They are just like a lot of children. Can you imagine a group of men spending a whole evening playing hide the symbol? They are such fun. Any little thing amuses them. Sunday afternoon, we usually take as many as can go on crutches or in wheelchairs out to the woods. They plan about it all week. You would think it was some wildly exciting excursion. What it really means is to amble out to the woods, sit down under the trees, cut a cake, and have a piece of chocolate. That is absolutely all, yet they never get tired of it. A lot of our best pets went back to the front about a week ago. We felt awful to see them go, for we shall never know what becomes of them. They went off to the station singing the Marseillaise, God Save the King, and Tipperary. I wish you could hear and see those boys sing the Marseillaise. There is nothing quite like it. One of the really interesting things that Marion did was to use a, a journal which I have in my hands here, uh, which was fairly standard practice, I come to find, in those days. Uh, but the contents of this journal are really unique. Um, they're the writings of uh, the soldiers uh, she nursed um, in Yvetot, in saint valery en caux And the documents range from, from poetry to very terse comments to incredibly poignant descriptions of the individual suffering um, experienced by these men. And I think that's, that's really the, the fascinating quality of this. But, but it shows me uh, that Marion touched the lives of these men in, in a very personal way. And I think in many ways this, uh, this journal was a way of giving back the individuality to these men which they had lost, which had been robbed by the incredible numbers of, of, of wounded and, and, and the terrible destruction. They were able to tell their own individual stories here. And I think that holds true for the photographs as well. One little youngster was operated on this afternoon. He's only 20, and when he was coming out of the ether, he cried and cried because he hadn't seen his mother for 13 months. He kept saying, it's too long, it's too long, but I must be brave. We are awfully busy. I have a sort of breathless feeling most of the time. There is hardly ever a chance to draw a full breath. Now the men are not directly from the trenches, but from hospitals at the front. You never smell such smells or saw such sights. I can't tell you how many amputations there were which had been done in other hospitals. Most will have to be done over. One man had both legs gone. He lay in a shell hole for six days. There was nothing to eat, but the hole was filled with water, and in that water lay the decaying body of his best friend, and he had to drink that water to keep alive. When I see these men shot full of holes and suffering the tortures of hell and maimed for life, all for nothing, all because one nation was bound to fight, well, I won't say what I think. In late 1915, a significant lack of funds for salaries, vital supplies, and equipment 
forced the American Red Cross to issue a recall of their 255 nurses serving overseas. Marion wrote that she had no intention of leaving. To their great credit, many of the other Red Cross nurses in Europe also elected to remain, giving up their salaries. From the first day of her service in France, Marion had contributed her salary toward the expenses of the hospital, as had Dr. Fitch. The hospital and the entire staff now depended upon contributions of money and supplies from families, friends, and organizations at home. What we need most is money, ether, gauze, and alcohol. Then for me, a hot water bottle, then five or six more batteries for my flashlight, two cakes of palm olive soap, and some carbolic soap, or some kind that is good for fleas. They are nearly killing me. Will you please have someone make for me three pairs of bloomers of gray chambray, which I can wear so that fleas won't get up under my clothes? Another subject that is often in our minds nowadays but isn't exactly elegant is poo. In other words, body lice. We've just been digging a cast off a boy which was absolutely walking away with body lice. So far, I've been lucky, but we picked 21 off Miss Wilson one night. The men say they are the Bosch poo. You can tell them because they are larger and livelier than French and have the iron cross on their backs. It was a challenge for the nurses to provide distractions for the soldiers, many of whom were young men, forced to spend many winter days indoors recovering from surgery. The holidays were an especially difficult time. We had an awfully good time at Christmas. We made the patients hang up socks, much to their amusement, for they had never heard of it before. They said they used to put out their shoes when they were children for the Petit Jesus, the little Jesus, but never socks. We filled those socks with oranges and chocolate and candy and cigarettes, postcards, writing papers and pens, pencils, all kinds of things they could use. The men were wild over their socks. Some of them woke up for them at 3 a.m. But I think the thing that gave the most pleasure of all was a phonograph that someone sent. The men simply love it. The winter has been extremely severe, but is now nearly past. I wish I could send you a picture of what I can see from the window here this afternoon. In the square by the town hall is a small heap of wet coal dust with possibly a few pieces of coal in it, while gathered around with sacks, little push carts, old baby carriages, are the poor of the town, all women and children. We have all been without coal, wood, and with kerosene limited, we felt the cold, but nothing like these people have. The arrival of this pathetic supply of coal was the event of the week. Nurse Mary K. Nelson. Much of the French population in the battle area, as you can expect, uh, had to be evacuated, anything within the range of the guns. But as soon as they could, they tried to move back and, and get back their homes or what remained of them and, uh, and take up their lives again. Uh, everything was set aside. Schooling was set aside. All the normal practices of life were, were simply had to be rediscovered and rebuilt. And so it was very severe. And uh, Marion and her hospital helped to deal with civilians as well as military people. Last week, we had a young boy who had nearly had his hand cut off. He had already developed gas gangrene and was so bad that he finally died. One of his brothers had been killed and another badly wounded. There is hardly a family anywhere that isn't in mourning for one or two people. On the last day of January 1917, the Germans notified the American government that any ships in the war zone, including the ships of neutral countries, would be subject to unrestricted submarine attacks. Four American ships were sunk by German torpedoes. On April 2nd, 1917, President Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war to make the world safe for democracy. I wish you could see and hear how our coming into the war has affected everybody. It would give you a warm feeling round your heart. It makes me glad America has come into the war because we can help stop this war madness. In the spring of 1917, the French government offered orthopedist Dr. Fitch and his skilled American medical team the opportunity to set up a hospital specializing in bone surgery because of the large numbers of soldiers with such injuries. It was located in Evreux, an important town on the main railway lines about 50 miles west of Paris, which allowed them to accept patients from all fronts. 
While waiting for this hospital to be made ready, Marion was able to spend a few days closer to the front lines. She and a few other nurses hired a horse and carriage for their excursion to the devastated countryside around the city of Compagne, north of Paris. The Germans had been driven back four months earlier, leaving a desolated landscape. The nearer I get to the war, the more confusing it seems. Neither pen nor camera can tell it, but I'll do my best. Trenches are everywhere, running in every direction, without rhyme or reason. The awful barbed wire. It's not just spread across in single file. There are rows and rows of iron posts, and the wire is crossed and recrossed and runs up and down and weaves and interweaves until it's the most devilish trap you ever imagined. If the men get caught in the barbed wire, they are pretty surely lost. Nobody can help them. They just die by inches, sometimes after days of agony. We came to a village which simply does not exist, just a waste of blocks of stone. We found two women who had just come back to find what was left of their home and to try to plant their garden. They had tried to patch up a corner of their house and were living there. Back from her excursion near the front, Marion started her duties at L'Hôpital Complémentaire, which had a capacity of 750 beds, the largest she had worked at in France. She had a first-hand look at new surgical techniques perfected by Dr. Fitch. It is awfully interesting getting new cases and seeing how quickly you can get them well. We are hooking a lot of the wounds together and saving the men weeks of time. It is astonishing what you can do. One man had two wounds, one on each side of his thigh. They were six or seven inches long, three or four inches broad, and to begin with were very deep and full of pus. We cleaned him up and stuck him together, and inside of three weeks he had healed, with scars not half an inch wide. After two and a half years of working together to save wounded soldiers, Dr. Fitch, his wife, and his medical team were honored by the French government. Last week, the French decorated Dr. Fitch with the Legion of Honor, and Miss Nelson, Miss Clay, and me with the Palms Académique. It is a decoration not as high as the Legion of Honor, still pretty high, and it is usually given to artists and writers and other professional people very seldom to nurses. It is not a distinctly war decoration. It is really awfully pretty. In October 1917, Marion returned to the United States on a three-month mission for the Red Cross to speak in selected eastern and midwestern cities about the urgent need for larger quantities of properly prepared bandages. Newspapers reported her remarks and called Marion a heroine for her nursing work overseas. On her return to France in December 1917, she found worsening conditions that affected French civilians, soldiers, and the nurses themselves. The bread is very much darker and tastes like uncooked grain. Butter, eggs, and milk are very scarce. Tobacco and matches you can hardly buy. Vegetables and meat are not the easiest things in the world to get. We get two lumps of sugar a day. We can't get petrol, so our stoves are useless. Luckily, we have a fireplace and some wood, so we can have a fire part of the time. One can hardly imagine the toll that uh, the nurses and the medical staffs must have experienced as a result of these great battles. Uh, but still, the scale was something that the world had never seen before. And the destructive power, from what we've seen, of these weapons in terms of what they would do to the human body, from machine guns and shrapnel and uh, large-scale shells, uh, the gas gangrene, the smell, the scent. Uh, I don't think there was anything that could psychologically have prepared. It must have been terribly damaging and, and stressful. These are terrible offensives, and you never know what may happen. The suspense is horrible. Every day you can't bear to see the news, and yet you can't wait until you do. I suppose you were all as much astonished as we were to hear about Paris being bombarded. The air raids are bad. We get an alert every time Paris does. All the lights go out and so forth, but no one has the least idea any Bosch plane will ever get here. No danger of that. They can't take Paris, and yet sometimes one gets terrified. Last week, things looked pretty dark. The convoy of British we got when I last wrote were awfully bad. They were all smashed up, gangrene and everything else. The doctors were operating day and night for a while. We were going from early morning till late at night, never stopping. 
Early in June 1918, the use of mustard gas by the Germans was increased to flush soldiers out of the trenches. All soldiers were issued face masks to keep them from inhaling the deadly gas, which smelled like mustard or garlic and caused blistering of the lungs. Day before yesterday, we heard there was a train with American wounded at the station, so a few of us rushed over. There were two trains of French, Italians, and Americans. The Americans weren't wounded. They were gassed, but only very slightly, for they didn't show the effects. A few looked pretty tired. Why won't our American boys keep their masks on? Will they never learn sense? The percentage of gas cases is appalling among them, not among the others. The Americans don't like to be uncomfortable, and of course the masks are not comfortable. On July 18, 1918, the Allied armies launched counterattacks against the Germans that continued successfully throughout the summer. By the middle of October, two million American soldiers had sailed for duty overseas. By early November, mutiny had spread throughout the German fleet and naval bases, and Kaiser Wilhelm II had abdicated. Tonight I am sitting up long enough to write this by the light of one dim candle. Just now we are full to overflowing and almost all fractures, horribly hard work, fractured femurs of every description. We are terribly short-handed. Every day more patience and less help. It is dreadful. We are all dead tired. But the news is so wonderful every day that you feel there will be an end sometime and a chance to rest. I wonder if peace is really coming. An armistice was signed between Germany and the Allies on November 11, 1918, at Compagne, France. The world's first global war, which involved 32 nations, had come to an end after four years of conflict and the loss of eight and one-half million people. Almost 300 American Red Cross nurses died from diseases such as typhus, tuberculosis, and pneumonia, contracted in the line of duty. Of course, the town went mad with the armistice. It is covered with flags and lanterns. There were all sorts of processions and celebrations. One very noticeable thing was that it was the children and little soldiers who made the noise, not the older people, nor the men who had been through it all. At the hospital, we celebrated four days ahead of time, got a false report, like many of the towns and cities. they were displaying I think was not so much the, the you know the front line combat in the trenches being shot at and shooting uh, it was much more that kind of courage that says you know these are very difficult times and very difficult conditions and we haven't got enough supplies and we haven't got enough coal and, and it's colder than Billy be damned in here uh, and I got 160 wounded men in some place that was meant to hold 30 uh, but you just keep on and do the very best you can, and you do that for four long years. Marion was, was right there with these men in the prime of their lives, uh, and having gone through some of the absolutely atrocious experiences that are outlined in the journal, that some of them recount as if it were a stroll in the park um, with um, grievous wounds. It's, uh, it's, it's emotional. It's... Uh, incredibly humbling um, and and again I think it's in the great tradition of the Red Cross that Marion volunteered for this sort of this sort of action they were women who'd been tested and tried in the fire of war and they had great credibility then as leaders a strong sense of priority and direction and they were very fine role models for those women of the 20s and 30s December 1918 Evreux we are just as busy as ever. No sign of a let-up yet. That is what comes of being a bone hospital. Anyhow, it looks as if before very long we should all be home. It may sound strange, but it makes me homesick to think of leaving France, much as I want to see you all at home. I foresee I shall always be torn in two directions. <laughs> 